în economia partidei Delgado, acolo este Partidul va fi corner, dragi ascultători. Hi everyone, forgive the spooky lighting. Um, here we go with my questions. Uh, Mark Jones asks if you could bring back an actor or filmmaker from retirement or death, one last movie, who would it be and what would be the project? Um, I had to think about this for a while, but I'm a big fan of Columbo and I'd like to see Peter Falk come back as a zombie, not as a zombie. Um, resurrected in whatever ghoulish fashion your question demands. I don't know where I'd put him though. I mean, I would definitely put kind of because, you know, it's very sadly, Peter Falk um, had kind of, I think, dementia issues and stuff and before he died, so he wasn't able to continue acting till the end. So sort of old man Falk in some kind of uh, overarching role, role, like the one of the Watchers or something from Marvel or, I don't know, or just some nice kind of Oscar bait shit. I just, he was great and I'd like to see him come back from the dead. So, I mean, the people who I feel like didn't get their dues... Um... Uh, who who died way too soon? Someone like Alan Rickman, obviously Bill Paxton, people like that. I think they had so much ahead of them, so much amazing work. They were all like gearing up to do, and, it, and I and I would love for them to still be around. I, I think it, it's it's almost criminal that they they went when they did. Who I would pull out of retirement for one last go around is definitely Gene Hackman. He's someone who I just is so incredibly magnetic on screen to watch, and I. And I I just adore his style of acting. I think he's fantastic. So, and I think it's a shame he kind of hung up his spurs when he did. Although I understand exactly why he did it. Um, and so, you know, I would res I respect his, you know, um, desire to retire when he did. But being a selfish twat, <laughs> I would I would I would love to have um, Gene Hackman back. And but as far as the project's concerned. I don't know. I don't care. Whatever. Whatever. It's just more gene all the time. All the time. Uh, Andre Joseph asks, is there a bad movie for the 80s or 90s that had a good enough concept to be re remade, remade today? Um, is the world ready for a reboot of Daryl, Andre? The, the D R A Y L Daryl the robot kid movie. Um, I always kind of never quite felt that movie as a kid. I you know I loved robots as I still do, and I could never really enjoy it to its full potential. So um, I want I want the remake of Daryl. It's like like I get a cool director to come and do like a a kid appropriate. It's essentially like Blade Runner for kids, isn't it? Like a kid appropriate existential robot film. <laughs> Um, and as long as they don't cast like a shit wanker as the kid, I don't care. But um, yeah, you know, because it's kind of not quite as fun as Short Circuit because it's not meant to be, but it plays in a similar thing in that the kid kind of escapes and whatnot. So yeah, I want a remake of Daryl. You know, that's your question. Yeah. Um... Um, yeah, there's there's lots of I, I, it's hard to pin one down actually because it you're talking about two very different time frames. I mean, something like uh, Fortress with um, Christophe Lambert is a big high concept film that I think the, the time the concept kind of outstripped the production values, but. I don't think you could, re if you remade it now, I guess you'd end up with escape plan. And, and you know, all the kind of high concept, uh, high security technology doesn't seem as kind of out there as it, as it did then, you know, and it's not as much of a high concept anymore. So it's, it's hard to say that that would work. Something like Blown Away, which is a film that sort of ebbs and flows, I think, in terms of that. that so I, I don't know if, I don't know if you've seen it, but um, with Jeff Bridges and um, Tommy Lee Jones, and it's a it's a sort of I think it would be perhaps a bit of a touchy subject to make a film now about you know bombers and rival bombers and bomb disposal I, you know it's perhaps not smart at this this particular time but I mean that's a film that I think it's one of those films I think people know about and people enjoy but it doesn't get discussed very often and I mean that as a concept and an idea seem to have I enjoyed it but the execution is perhaps 
perhaps would have let it down. Although I, I don't know actually. I mean, it was. I don't know. I don't know. But I always enjoy. Maybe maybe I just enjoy it because I like Jeff Bridges so much. I, who knows? Um, but films like that, there were certain films. I think perhaps like things like the adventure films, a lot more of those. Like I think they they sort of came and went, and, and I think actually there is there is a bit of scope for doing those again um whether it's because you do uncharted or you do tomb raider stuff those are properties that mm -hmm. can work but um yeah i don't know it's a bit of a <laughs> yeah, bit of a weak source answer to your question there andre sorry about that but yeah Hello, Rich and Duncan. How's it going? If you could pull a film from an alternate reality where something that shit happened different, where something that shit happened differently and it's good, what film would it be? For example, I believe there's an alternate reality where Tim Burton and Michael Keaton did Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, and they're just magic. With Danny Elfman doing the music again, and maybe even more of Michelle Pfeiffer too, because that's how Returns ended. Just how Batman '89 Returns are very special. That that two films will be too. Um, yeah, films not living up to their potential. That's kind of a, it's kind of similar, similar one to Andre's question where I said Daryl. But um, if I was to do another one, uh, I'll be honest with you, actually, like, though I just mentioned it and I'm on a robot tip, I'm not mad about the first short circuit. I love the puppetry in it. I think, the, I think this is just really amazing puppetry. I think the second one's better. Yeah, that's right. Second short circuit's better. Um, so like, I'd quite like to see that done again, which they did sort of talk about for a while. Short Circuit 2 is fine, though. You leave, you leave Short Circuit 2 alone. Um, in terms of something else that was just kind of rubbish and didn't quite work, oh, I know, if you're taking it, yeah. Actually, one of the most disappointing films I saw in the cinema was Looper, and I've talked about this before. I just think it, it's a great concept, but it just did not live up to its potential at all, and, and it was just kind of messy. I think that and Last Jedi, Gasp, are the only um, Ryan Johnson films I've ever actually seen. And I know... They allege that Shane Carruth was involved in Looper in some consulting capacity, which he probably didn't consult a lot because it was rubbish. Um, but I would, I think someone else could do Looper better. And I think if I had that slider's technology, yeah, go and get the good version of Looper. I, I, I wouldn't even change the cast. I think a lot, you know, a lot of the actual, the way they mounted that production is really nice. There's loads of good, great performances. There's, um, okay, so there's questions about uh, the plastic nose on uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, but um, yeah, I would go for the for a double dip on Looper, get someone better to do it and rewrite it. So there you go. I've discussed this before, but I think uh, not even film, but series of films. I think some. I think I think we're in the parallel universe where the Marvel movies somehow did better than the DC ones, <laughs> or, or, the, or the, in terms of the, the cinematic universe. I have never understood why it is that we can't seem to get a DC. Um, collective together to, that works. It, they have the for me the better character. That's not to, that's not to do down the Marvel Cinematic Universe because it's, it's it's incredible and and it's and and, and um, I, I I really enjoy it and I think it's great and I, I'm all for it. But it is a weird. I feel like we've it's like a sort of squandered opportunity that we don't have the Justice League in the then that whole that as being this kind of the flag bearer for this kind of stuff so um yeah i would probably that's that's what i would pull from it is a sort of world where we have this really cohesive dc thing with with superman and batman and the, and the you know the help the helm if you like and yeah but there you go Mike Kingston asks, what do you think of Billy Zane playing Marlon Brando in the upcoming, upcoming film, Little White Lies? Um, I, that's quite interesting, actually, I think. I'd be interested to see how that is. I, I, I kind of feel like Billy Zane, he's an odd one, really. I feel like he perhaps never really reached his potential. And he's certainly gone off and done some interesting stuff over the years, like outside of, you know, his supposed stardom. Because, uh, you know, I think he was set up to be hot shit and kind of wasn't in the end, wasn't he? Um, and there's a, there is a... There's very much a young Brando-ness, well, not young anymore, I suppose Billy Zane's probably in his 50s, but, like, if you look at sort of, I don't know, say, like, on the waterfront Brando, like, you know, classic Brando, uh, Billy Zane looks a lot like him. Um, I mean, the fact he ended up, Brando turned into a fucking donut. I mean, we've seen, uh, we've seen the, Richard, the documentary about Richard Stanley, so, um, Dr Moreau, where he was just sort of acting up and being a naughty, a big naughty boy. Um, 
you know, not ideal. But I think it's a good choice. I think it's an interesting choice. And I think definitely Billy Zane kind of has an eye on Brando. I mean, loads of actors do, right? Like Brando's this sort of gold standard that's held up for some reason. Well, not for some reason. But I think it's interesting. I'd be interested to see it. And I, and I hope he does a good job of it. Um, so, yeah, interesting choice. Billy Zane playing Marlon Brando. I didn't know that was happening. Um, but um, that makes sense. I like Billy Zane. I love Marlon Brando. Good. Omar Zambon asks, to Richard, if you could make a Star Trek film set after the events of Voyager, what would it be about? A film? Interesting. Um, the one pitch that I heard, and this is a bit of a cop-out because I'm just kind of basically taking someone else's idea, there was an animated series that never happened, like a kind of, I don't want to say failed animated series, but a pitched animated series. You can go read all about it online. There's videos about it. And um, my thing is, just go, you need, to, you need to make the jump like they did from... Uh, I'm wearing this nice hoodie that Ellie bought me today, by the way. It's my Ben Cisco hoodie um, for, my, for my birthday. You need uh, to make the jump like they did from TOS to TNG. Just like give yourself that distance, set it like 80 years hence or whatever to avoid all of that so you can tell your own stories. I think the premise of the animated series that never happened was that um, something like there's some kind of space pollution, so warp drives don't work anymore. So everybody's kind of. Uh, retreated to their own borders and you can't travel at super speeds anymore apart from through certain places and the uh the federations become very stagnated and insular and i know i always rail against kind of needlessly dark stuff but the point of the show was as i understood it that um the federations become insulated and kind of people don't want to explore anymore and they make a new enterprise and the new captain of that enterprise is all about like no we should go back to our roots and we should have optimism we should explore and we should reach out and be diplomats again and um I like that. It's an optimistic thing, and it's, I, I guess it's 100 years hence or whatever, so you don't have to worry about any of the, you know, touching onto other stuff. Because what frustrates me about Star Trek is they keep looking backwards, as I've said a number of times. Um, so, you know, I would do that. Set it, set it far ahead and, and have, about, have it about a renewed sense of optimism instead of being about kind of screaming and war, which is what it seems to have become in the last few years. And uh, I, th I believe that I'm going to be treated to an episode of, uh, of Star Trek Discovery shortly, because uh, for it is Friday, and, and that's what's going on Netflix at the moment. So uh, that is, is not tickling my pickle at the moment. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Omar, what do I think of the latest delay to Bond 25? Uh, I have no idea. I, I, I assume it's because they want to get it right. Um, I think these have become behemoths of films now, um, just in terms of the talent they attract and the aesthetic they're going for, and that's fine. And I think, you know, sometimes you have to get them right. It's the, I think the days of pumping them out every couple of years, you know, for the time being, are over. Um, so we just have to accept these delays that, that come along. Um, I don't mind. Uh, I'm sort of used to it now. So... <laughs> uh, yeah, there's not much more else to say. I mean, we, I'm not, I'm, I'm not on the inside track on that, so it's, it's hard to say. But, um, but there we yeah. are. Nice. Uh, Will New, we all know you're a major movie enthusiast, but what music do you guys like, and who's your favourite artist? Um, Duncan and I have vastly different musical tastes, and I've been like into what was once called the rave scene, it's not really that, but that kind of stuff since I was a teenager. So I grew up listening to um, drum and bass um, and like electronic dance music, like EDM is not a thing. It's just like that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my taste. So I like a lot of drum and, ba drum and bass. I like DJ Randall and, you know, Ronnie Size and uh, High Contrast is one of my favorites. And he's sort of moving away from drum and bass in a small way. Um, that's, that is, is my kind of music really. And, you know, Andy C and whatnot. Um, also always liked hip hop. I was a big Run DMC fan when, I'm, when I was younger. I really love Run DMC. I really love um, Sugar Hill, uh, Sugar Hill Gang and the Sugar Hill Records, uh, and Melly Mel and Furious Five. It's kind of classic, classic rap. Beastie Boys, I love. Um, I'm kind of into funk and soul and R&B as well. So, uh, and actually a bit of disco. So like Todd Terje and stuff like that, like kind of new disco. Um, I like things like Bill Withers and whatnot as well. And it, it's quite disparate. It's on a certain side of things. Um, it's, this is definitely 
the absolute opposite of what um of what Duncan I have no idea. Duncan's gonna say something about the Dave Matthews band, aren't you, Duncan? And other stuff. I don't think I've ever <laughs> I don't think Duncan and I have ever sat and listened to music together. I don't think <laughs> it'd be really weird and just totally jarring. Um uh, so there you go. What type of music do I listen to? Well, I used to play in a band, actually, Will. Um, in fact, a few bands. Some of uh, the music is still available on online, uh, on uh, on Spotify, if you've got that. Um, and um, I was influenced a lot by kind of uh, jam bands in the 90s, sort of rock, jam, fusion. Uh, I'm a drummer. I play guitar as well. And um, yeah, I always, I've always loved live music. I've always loved the, the kind of watching musicians, like really good musicians play. And um, so uh, I used to love things, bands like, um, I love bands, so classic bands like uh, Stones and um, Beatles to an extent, um, uh, Toto. Um, loads of different you know uh, Clapton obviously uh, fantastic and then you know Foo Fighters Pearl Jam um, you know those guys were were pretty cool I used to like listening to those guys still do um, even stuff like the Eurythmics and, and Fleetwood Mac and that kind of stuff you know they were, they were incredibly creative um, and um, inspiring. I love uh, the Dave Matthews Band. If you're in America, you've probably heard of them here, less so, but they, 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 that, that's really the music that I kind of keyed into with guitar. Um, it just came at a time in my life where I wanted to pick up a guitar and learn it, and I, and I learned a load of Dave Matthews, and um, that's not, not, <laughs> it's probably not the best stuff to learn in terms of, um, of, of the, the guitar works very complicated, and, difficult and not um, particularly standard so it's not a great place to start but I mean I, I love it and uh, so I was a huge fan of theirs and, and, I, and I continue to be and I've seen them live when they've been over here and I've seen Dave Matthews live um, uh, with Tim Reynolds acoustic set uh, and yeah they're, they're, they're for me quite an enduring band that, that's managed to reinvent themselves and still remain incredible live if you've never if you I mean it, it's, it's not the type of music you're into that's fine but it, it is as far as like live musicians go I think they're up there and they also attract some of the most incredible live musicians and you know they've even played with they played with Stevie Wonder they played with all, all James Brown all sorts of people live so um, yeah go check them out Uh, favorite biopic? Uh, don't know. Don't watch an awful lot of them, but um, not again. Not because I don't want to, just because I just haven't. Uh, private parts. I don't know. What's your favorite biopic? Uh, my favorite biopic is Ed Wood. Uh, I'm not generally a Tim Burton fan, and I kind of feel like he made a grown-up film by accident when he made Edward. I think Edward's a really wonderful movie. I, I could watch it over and over and over, and it, it plays in the world of kind of it being a Tim Burton thing. It is kind of partially a fantasy. It's kind of, or it's fantastic at least, you know, in the truest sense of fantasy and fantastic. Um, yeah, I really, really love Edward. Uh, it's not a genre I'm mad about for the most part, unless you've got something interesting to do with it. And I think Edward does do something very interesting with its source material. Mark Jones asks uh, about cinematic dicks, i.e., yeah, people that aren't kind of full-on villains, but just kind of dicks. Um, I didn't I give myself enough time to think about this, uh, but I did. What I'd, something I do kind of like to think about is, so in, in uh, Day of the Dead, you have Captain Rhodes, right? And R.I.P. Joe Palato just this week, which is very sad. Uh, you have Captain Rhodes, and he is like this insane, maniacal fruitcake of a villain. You know, runs around screaming all the time and whatnot, and that's great. Uh, however, it, his like cadre of soldiers um, are, are are mostly just dicks that are following orders, and it all kind of goes south. And you, to a small degree, feel sorry for him at the end, but they're just sort of going along with what this asshole says. So Steel Steel's the guy with the beard who ends up shooting himself. Steel's a total dick, and you know you just sort of think like if it wasn't for this. He's exactly, Stuart Lee did a bit about how Richard Hammond is worse than Jeremy Clarkson because Richard Hammond's the bully's friend. 
and the bully's friend is worse than the bully, right? Because it's just a weak person that's latched on to someone. Um, that's what Steel is like, and Steel is such a dick. And him and I can't remember his uh, Steel and uh, Rickles. Steel and Rickles is a, a double act of dicks. The way they kind of laugh together and stuff, and they've got all these shitty jokes they have, and they're always squawking at each other. Fucking brilliant! Like such a great double act. Uh, and yeah, just kind of dicks, really. In any other film, if it wasn't for the kind of apocalyptic circumstances, they'd just be assholes. Um, and in, for the most part, in Day of the Dead, they're assholes that are just doing what this bigger kid tells them to do. So there you go. Cinematic dicks. Um, Cinematic dicks. And by dicks, I'm assuming you don't mean um, uh, detectives. I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, you've named some great ones here. Um, Captain Harris, Walter Peck. Yes. Uh, I suppose Carter Burke's got to be up there, isn't he? You know, or Carter gobshite um but you know paul riser makes him still somehow somehow you're taken in by him as well um so i think that's a really good example of, of, a, of a cinematic gobshite <laughs> or dick that, that everyone has. and then there's other types of dicks aren't there like i i think like john goodman plays a good dick in uh, the big lebowski i think walter sobchek is uh, arguably a bit of a twat um, but a lovable one, you know, one that you, you sort of, you're still on his side, but he's like, he's, he acts like such a twat all the way throughout the film, but it's, but endearingly so. So, um, those are two examples. So Boris, yes, I, I believe well, we touched on this in the, um, uh, in the, the hangout the other day but um, yes I do copywriting in fact I'm in the midst of doing uh, a copywriting job at the moment for a uh, Indian concrete company um, as it happens uh, yeah it's something I think that you can turn your hand to I think if you've got a good strong grasp of uh, the um, of, of, of grammar in the English language then it's something you can do uh, it is very I found it to be very flexible um, in terms of, you know, obviously for me it's very handy because being an actor, you know, you need you need to be able to have something you can drop uh, at the drop of a hat to go off and do uh, auditions or even jobs, you know. So that's I, I find it very useful for that. As as far as it, it um, I'm, I'm building it up to being a, a proper income. It's not quite there yet, but it is certainly very handy to have, and it it, it, and it you know it, it helps out a lot. Um, and um, I am I am working on I'm, I'm finding I'm able to sort of drum up um, quite decent business through it at the moment and it's just a case of uh, getting it to a sort of even keel and I think really for you Boris I mean as we as we talked about um, it's a case of I would try and find an agency that will take you on and um, provide you with work initially just to get you started to get you a bit of a uh, track record in it um, that's what I did uh, and uh, and then sort of build on it from there see how you feel about it see how you get on um, but yeah let me know Hi Boris, um, yeah, so there is a book called The Best of Judge Dredd which is just a kind of, it was originally a hardback now it's a paperback uh, of notable Dredd stories which is just designed for people who are new to the characters, so that's quite useful. Well, I'm not going to be lazy, I do have a proper answer. Um, there are, here's my handful of recommendations. They've printed, started printing everything in chronological order in what are called case files, and in case files five, which is the fifth year of Dread, so from like 1982, uh, that's the best place to start if you want to be chronological, um, just because it's where it all kicks into gear, and it has the story of the Apocalypse War in it, which is Dread versus the Soviet Union, um, which is a really fun story, and also the first Judge Death stuff, and just some of the best creative teams in it so that's really good I would also say to read America by Colin McNeil and John Wagner which is kind of uh, the first sort of proper mediation on dread as a fascist and, and what it's like to be uh, in Mega City One and stuff as a citizen uh, there's The Pit which is uh, the kind of the first modern era like properly procedural dread story in the 2012 film name checks a lot of characters from the pit it's a great story and it's one of my favorites and um finally trifecta by simon spirit al ewing um and rob williams as writers and artists with different artists as well um it's one it's a good example of modern funny yet exciting adventure dread stuff
So th those be my recommendations. So, uh, yeah, I would love to do a commentary and an episode on Hardboiled. Hardboiled is one of my favourite films, and it's my favourite John Woo film, and I think it's probably one of the best action films ever made, full stop. I just, it's incredible. It's an incredible film. I just think from budget versus kind of uh, end product, the, the pure, sheer spectacle of Hardboiled is, is wonderful. It's an amazing film. So, yeah, I'd, I would talk about Hardboiled forever. Um... I don't really have any particularly strong thoughts on Wonder, on Wonder World, on Water World. It's not the kind of train wreck that everybody makes out it is or was. Um, you know, it's fine. I went to see it in the cinema when it came out. I didn't know there was going to be an Arrow release. That's interesting. But it looks like Arrow are doing Robocop as well, weirdly. Um, so Arrow are definitely on the up and up in that sense, I guess. Um, just down the road in Hertfordshire, Arrow. True story. Hard boiled, yeah. Um, I'd be happy to. I've not seen the movie, um, in, certainly not in its entirety, but I'd be very happy to give it a watch. And um, again, that might create a nice dynamic. I know it's something Richard's uh, fairly well versed in, so it might create a nice dynamic in terms of um, fresh eyes and old, decrepit, cone shaped eyes that Richard, <laughs> that Richard has. Sorry, I just shouldn't say that. No, Richard, you've got fantastic eyes. Ignore me. Waterworld, yeah, uh, that's a film I don't mind looking at again. Um, it's I, again not a film I've really kind of watched a lot of. I have seen it in dribs and drabs over the years with bits I've caught on TV and stuff, and it's I, it's fine. I'm not, I, I like Kevin Costner, so and of course Dennis Hopper, always good. So yeah, it's a film perhaps I should really look at and. Um, Thing. I'm not sure what Richard's history is with it, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Hey, look, the world is our oyster at this stage, so I'm sure it's something we'll, 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 we'll think about getting to. Uh, movie Dream Team. Um, these, I, I mean, these sorts of questions, I, for me, it would be largely comprised of people I've already worked with, um, directors, producers, and stuff who I have a an existing history with. Um, I know the, the the question is probably more angled at name famous directors and producers and cast that you'd like to work with. And while there are people I hugely respect and admire and, um, you know, I, I would love to work with, um, I think probably, you know, in, in, in talking in real terms, um, I there are just people who I have worked with and, and enjoyed working with immensely and would love to to keep working with so um, you know in terms of uh, uh, directors obviously Brad Watson would love to get to do something with him again I uh, love to working with Mark Price on Fistful of Lead I'm hoping we get to do something again soon together um, Jamie Stone fantastic director a uh, uh, guy I worked with last year on something that I'm not allowed to talk about yet <laughs> but um, something really pioneering and really you know I felt like we kind of we created a process there together all of us you know with all the crew and all the cast and, and everyone um, I yeah I was hugely proud of what we did on that so I'm hoping that you know I, I get to work with him again um, in terms of producers um, my my my, my my great friend and champion, Ben Jakes, um, is a guy I've worked with a lot. Uh, he produced Accident Man, he's produced uh, Hatton Garden Job, uh, many, many, many cool movies and uh, that I've worked with him on over the years. And he's always been a champion of mine and, and a really, you know, just all round good dude and someone I love working with. So, you know, certainly him. Um, in terms of cast, again, like lots of people I've enjoyed working with over the years, it's very hard to sort of figure out. I mean, again, I know, I'm, I'm assuming you want me to name uh, well-known famous people. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've had brush, brushes with famous people and, and, and of, of different strata, I suppose, and, uh, and enjoyed all of them. I mean, you know, some people it's been amazing to be in their presence. Uh, but I, you know usually that's in a much more limited capacity so it's not actually working with them in any great way um 
It's really hard, you know. I mean, actually, in terms of cast, it's more about who fits what role. It's not about, you know, is someone decent. There are people I've worked with who I've enjoyed working with thoroughly and um, and would work with in a heartbeat. But I mean, you know, we'd all have to be right for the respective roles. So um, I know that's a really sort of vague and nebulous answer, perhaps. But um, my dream team would be comprised of, of of people I've I've worked with in the past and had fun because it's all about, you know that camaraderie and, and that sort of uh, shorthand that you have for working with each other. And um, whilst I would love to work with Christopher Nolan or Steven Spielberg or these people, you know, just as a, because they are the, the architects of my childhood in lots of ways um, and, and adulthood, um, I don't think that, I don't know. I mean, the intimidation factor would be incredibly high there for one. But also, I, I've never worked with them, so I don't know. I don't know that we would be compatible. I don't know that we would get on. I, it's it's hard to say. So, um, yeah, that's weird, isn't it? But I hope that helps give you some idea. Anyway. Um, what movie does everyone seem to love that you really don't enjoy? I fully recognise that. I like Peter Jackson as a filmmaker, and I recognise the art and everything in Lord of the Rings, but that kind of stuff does nothing for me. Leaves me cold, much like Bond, it just does nothing for me. So I'm constantly told how amazing they are. I have seen them, I find them a bit dull, I'm not really into Tolkien, I'm not really into kind of that fantasy stuff, so it's not my cup of tea. Clearly good movies, but it does nothing for me at all. Um, I did not see Venom. Uh, it's weird that despite everything it seems to have done well and people have used that to go into the nexus of audience versus critics, you know. Um, I'd like to see it because I like Venom. I always liked Venom as a kid, as a Spidey villain. I just think having a fucking, um, sp essentially a Spider-Man film without Spider-Man in it is, is it's just v v uh, virgin, fucking, what am I talking about? Sony being Sony, really. And now there's a Michael Morbius, The Living Vampire film without Spider-Man. So... <laughs> You know, um, don't know what to tell you. Don't know what to tell you. Um, what movie does everyone love that I don't? Uh, there's a few. There's a few. I uh, in most recent times, I guess. <laughs> I, should, I don't want to get in shit for saying it, but um, Aquaman. I, I, I don't understand the love that everyone's given for it. That's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm, you know, I, hey, it's a film that came out and did well and that's some more for that, but yeah, I, did, I don't understand the love. Um, did I see Venom? No, I didn't see Venom. Um, not through any animus or anything like that, but I just didn't get a chance to. Um, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't at the top of my list to go to see the cinema, but, uh, and then all the things I've heard about it since, I've kind of gone, eh, you know. I'll get it. I mean, look, if it comes out on Netflix or Prime, then, then I'll watch it. Um, that's really tough for me, actually, because I kind of think to a degree, because Codronica is already fully 3D, you can kind of reasonably well upscale that to HD, which they've done. So if you gun to my head, I choose Resident Evil 3, because Resident Evil 3, I just don't think it's the love. And if it was remade in the style of Resident Evil 2, and, you know, had a bigger scope than the remake of 2, it would be a fucking awesome experience. And I, I'm really up for it. I just, that new style of Resident Evil, I'd like to see them do Resident Evil 3 like that, and it looks as if we're going to get it. And really, I would actually like both of them done like that. But I think on a technical level, Code Veronica is kind of advanced enough to not necessarily need it. Whereas Resident Evil 3 could really use that, I think. And I think it's probably gonna because Resident Evil 2 made all of the money. And then you can expect me to play the fuck out of it on streams when it comes out. When it comes out. So uh, yeah, there you go. True Detective Season 3, they directed the first episode, Jer Jeremy Saunier. I haven't knowingly sit Safi's asking about Jeremy Saunier of True Detective. I haven't actually watched any of his films knowingly. Sorry. Uh, yeah, really sorry about that. I apologise. So that's that. Thank you guys so much for, for, for all your questions. I'm sorry it took a while to get these mailbag episodes done. Yeah, really appreciate the... Um... The, the, the questions and, and everything and yeah keep them coming we'll, we'll definitely be back for more uh, soon 
Thank you again so much for your continued support. Please keep enjoying Valverde Broadcasting. Thanks so much. Cheers. Support your 7th or 8th favourite YouTube channel by buying crap, tat, junk, hogwash and filth at redbubble.com slash people slash Valverde shop.